introduce our first speaker tonight. It's been a pleasure spending time with her this weekend and, and getting to know her a little better. And she comes to us from Dallas, Texas. No, Flower Mound, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, I apologize. We could back up the recording and start it over again. Flower Mound, Texas. <laughs> I'm just real grateful for her to be here, and, and I hope that you all enjoy what she has to say. And her name is Brenda. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Bren, and I am many things, one of which is a grateful member of Al-Anon. And I say it that way because when I first came into the program, alcoholism loomed very large in my life. And all I was really able to see was alcoholism and the negative effects it had on me, especially, and of course those I love. And I know that I just don't want um, the disease of alcoholism to define me. And I don't want recovery from the disease of alcoholism to define me either. either. I have found um, that for me, my recovery in the program of Al-Anon is a starting point rather than an ending point. Al-Anon has given me many gifts, one of which is the ability to decide who I'm going to be and what I'm going to be about. And before I came in the program, I didn't know what kind of music I liked or what kind of food I liked. or. or I didn't even know when I was sick. People would have to say, you're sick, you need to go see the doctor, because I just didn't know. Um, I don't want to stand up here tonight and, and tell you the story of the alcoholics in my life. I just have better ways to spend my time. Um, I'm supposed to share what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, here's the thing, you know what it's like, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, for me, uh, I believe I grew up in an alcoholic home with multiple alcoholics and or addicts. And things were very scary, they were unpredictable. Sometimes it was abusive, it was often neglectful, it was hopeless, it was spirit crushing. and. Um, I used to get put out of the house quite a bit once I, I made it to high school, if, you know, for minor infractions, like I didn't empty the dishwasher, and, and I would get put out of the house for that, and I would have to rely on the kindness of other people. Um, so, you know, it, it was difficult. And the last time I got put out of the house, I, I actually left. Like, I got on an airplane and I left. And, you know, there was a fork in a road with that. And I hadn't done anything. I hadn't done, well, I'd had a really bad attitude. <laughs> like, I, I was a nice, I was a good girl with a bad attitude. And um, <laughs> it's, that's the best way to describe it. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't use drugs, I didn't have a boyfriend, like, you no know, promiscuity. But, you know, I, I had a bad attitude. And, and I, I was left at a fork in the road because I, I really wanted to go to college because everybody I knew was going to college and because I knew that that was my meal ticket out of my, uh, out of my, my home. And so um, I thought about it and I decided that it would be worth eating crow and calling up my mother and apologizing for what I don't know exactly to be the case. And, and I did some math. I'm not very good at math, but I'm really good at money kind of numbers. And um, I figured out how much money I would make every time I got hit. And I thought, you know what? I'm willing to get hit for that tuition money. And so I did that. And I went to college. And um, so that's what it was like. And what, what happened is, like every good Al-Anon, uh, the first day the upperclassmen were on campus, I chose a, a good alcoholic for myself. And like, he didn't even make it to his dorm room before I, 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 I had my eye on him. And, um, 
and I went on to marry him. And so there's there's a whole story with that, um, most of which you won't hear about. But <laughs> but what happened is. Um, he would share with me about his family, and there were a lot of similarities I noticed between his family and my family. But the major difference was his family had a label, and it was called alcoholism. And um, the more I heard about it from his family, the more I realized, gosh, you know what? Maybe the reason my mom was like passed out on the floor so much, like maybe she wasn't sick or something. And maybe the reason I had a hard time waking up my father wasn't just because he was a heavy sleeper. Um, I come from an Irish Catholic family, and let me tell you, everyone in our family drank that way. All of our friends drank that way. I knew that there was something wrong with our family, but um, on the outside, we looked really good. And so other people, you know, I just didn't think anybody knew. And... And I, I didn't have a label for it. And so uh, David took me to my first Al-Anon meeting about six months into our relationship. It was really not a very impressive meeting. It was the two of us and the lovely woman that volunteer, volunteered to chair the newcomers meeting. And I didn't really like it. And I didn't go back until um, the end of my freshman year that summer when our relationship was kind of circling the drain. And, and that's when I really started going to Al-Anon. And that would have been in May of 1985. So what it was like and what happened is a little different for each of us. But here's the thing, and we know this, right? Alcoholism is the great equalizer. Alcoholism doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what color you are, what race you are, what sex you are, what your socioeconomic status is. Alcoholism doesn't care. That's why we can identify with one another. Um, but because regardless of our circumstances, our experience is very much the same. And I have to say, one of the things I most love about the programs of AA and Al-Anon is that some of the people I am absolutely closest to in my life are people that were not for the programs of AA and Al-Anon. I never would have associated with them. I never would have met them. And today, they're like my family. And I love that about the program. I love that. Um, we have suffered at the hands of a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease. And that's what all of us really have in common. Um, so what I'd really like to focus on tonight is what it's like now and what I've gleaned from the program. When I first came into Al-Anon, like most people, I came to better understand the alcoholic. And they corrected me. They're like, no, no, no. Al-Anon is not about better understanding the alcoholic. It's about better understanding yourself. And that's true, and it's good. And I did that. I, I got to better understand myself. But what I eventually learned in Al-Anon is that what it's really about is learning to understand him. And when I say him, I say it with a capital H. I, I like to refer to my higher power as God. I'm not a very good person yet. I don't really care so much uh, about your spirituality and, and what works for you. Like, you're, you're going to get, uh, you know, whatever you plant. So if you choose to make a doorknob your higher power, have at it. Good luck with that. I don't care. It's not going to go very well for you, but that's your business. Um, if you choose to make the group that you're in your higher power, God bless you. You know, go, go with God. But the first time there's some, you know, discord in your group, good luck with that. Um, so I do have a higher power. I, I uh, too, refer to my higher power as a him rather than a her, but that's not because I necessarily think that God is a male versus a female. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, Al-Anon taught me to understand who I am, which is really good. But after decades in the program, I've learned it's more important that I understand whose I am. I've learned that I need to work all the steps and I need to work them in order. It's okay if I trip through them. It's okay if I work them poorly. Because you see, as long as I stay in the program of Al-Anon, I'm gonna get a chance to rework those steps and I'm gonna become more proficient each time I work them. I do have to be honest, prayerful, and I have to do my best. So, 
I want to speak for a moment about what constitutes our best. Because I personally, yeah, he knows. <laughs> I personally think that's one of the biggest lies that people tell in the program. Oh, wait, you know, they did their best. He did his best. You did the best you could at the time. Really? Really? Honestly? Because I don't know what constitutes your best. But I'll tell you a little bit about what constitutes my best. So I have been showing up at Al-Anon meetings every week for 34 years. Sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes three or four times a week. And rarely do I ever get up and say, oh my goodness, I can't wait to go to my Al-Anon meeting tonight. <laughs> Honestly, I almost never want to go. And you know what? I get up and I go anyway. I, I seek wise counsel. It talks a little bit about this in the big book. It talks about seeking help from professionals. I like professionals. I like lawyers. I like accountants. I like financial advisors. I like doctors. I like therapists. You know why? It, because, because there are people, I know it's hard to believe, but there are people in this world that do not work a program, and they actually are healthier than we are. <laughs> They're out there. I didn't believe that for the longest time, but I'm telling you to trust me on this one. There are some out there, and they, they can be helpful. I have a prayer life. I pray every day, every day. I make sure, and, and, and not just at one point in the day. I pause, and I go back, and I make sure I get that time with my higher power. I can feel when I'm getting off the rails. I read my Al-Anon literature. I read a lot of other, other books. Al-Anon is not a religious program. And again, I have a vested interest in really only one of you here tonight. Um, so I don't want to say I don't care about any of you, but like, it just doesn't matter to me what you do. It's not going to have an impact on my life. But I promise you, it will have an impact on your life. So while Al-Anon is not a religious program, I choose to go to church. You see, when I go to church and my children who may or may not choose to, to go to Al-Anon, that's something they can participate in with, in, with me in, and, and that matters to me. So when I do all of those things day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, then I've done my best. So I don't really want to hear about people that say, well, you know, I went to Al-Anon for six months, and, you know, we, we tried canceling. You know what my sponsor told me when we tried canceling and it didn't work? Find another counselor. And I said, well, you know, this is like our fifth counselor. Great, find number six. That's your best. Um, yeah, it's gotten very quiet. Um, <laughs> So that brings us to step one, and I'm not doing a big book workshop or, or uh, any kind of workshop, so I'm not going to get through all the steps tonight, but I do want to discuss a few of them. Um, it's, it was easy for me to admit when I first came in the program that my life was unmanageable, and while we don't always want to admit we're powerless, it only takes a certain amount of reasonableness, because, you know, al tend to be type A kind of people. We get the job done. We know how to do that, right? And... Um, you know, if we could have fixed the problem, we would have fixed the problem because I can assure you, if there's one thing we really did try our best at, it was fixing the alcoholic. And it didn't work. And, and so that part of step one, you know, was kind of easy. But after a while, I learned for me that what step one really means is, I know, I know it's shocking, I'm not God. I'm not my God, I'm not your God, I'm not, let any, I'm not anyone's God. And it's really best that I just let other people be who they are and experience the consequences of, of their actions, decisions, words, and attitudes. And it's my responsibility to make sure I become who God calls me to be. And that was step one for me. So when I got to step two, what I learned is that life always works vertically before it ever works horizontally. It's always going to be between me and God before it's ever going to be between me and you. I learned that when the only way out is through, 
My higher power will take me through. He will create a way. I can be measured about many things in my life and in my program, but I can't be ha half measured about my relationship with him. That's either all or nothing. And in AA, you know, they refer to that as the second step proposition. Because of the history with my family and um, maybe just how God made me, how I am, I don't know. But I know a lot about fear. I know how I can just be fine one moment and then the fear just comes upon me. You see, David spoke a little bit about a fear inventory. And when I look at my fears, I like to categorize them. If my house is burning down, if my house is on fire, it's a legitimate fear. If, if my husband starts having a heart attack right now, that's a legitimate fear. And then there are other fears I have that I like to refer to as illegitimate. They're just kind of crazy fears that I have. It matters that I know which ones are legitimate and which ones are illegitimate. Because many times, if I have a legitimate fear, it may require some action on my part. If the house is on fire, I need to get everyone out. I need to call 911. I need to take some action. With an illegitimate fear, maybe not as much, probably not at all. But here's the thing. Whether it's legitimate or whether it's illegitimate, I still have to handle the fear. Fear will always be my fallback position when I misplace my faith. How do I have or how do I get faith? When I allow my circumstances to overwhelm me, in this case alcoholism, then they have become my God. I become filled with self because I can find no way out. Sound familiar? The more I rely on myself, the more fearful I become. For me, that was the life cycle of alcoholism in my life. That brought me to step three. I'm kind of a word person. I, I, I take things very literally. And so, you know, I worked that step. I broke it up into pieces, made a decision. I made a decision about what to wear tonight, what to eat at supper. Uh, you know, I made a decision to be here to speak tonight. I don't have problems making decisions. I am an excellent decision maker to turn my will and my life. That's a little harder. What I want and the condition and circumstances of my life, that's kind of tough. Over to the care of a higher power. God is not a terrorist, as we understood him. And I figured out after a while that it was the as we understood him part that kept getting me. Um, the reason for that is because until I can tell you exactly how I understand my higher power to be, what attributes does my higher power possess, then I'm going to have a difficult time turning my will and my life over to the care of him. Here's the thing, and this is important. The question is not, what is God going to do for me? The question is, who is God going to be for me? So, I would encourage each of you, if you have not done so already, make a list of attributes that you believe your higher power possesses. I'm going to share with you my list. Again, I have no vested interest in, the only thing I, I have a vested interest in his list. Other than that, it doesn't really affect me. And let me tell you, I, if I don't like it, I correct him. <laughs> He knows I do. I serve a God of provision, a God of restoration, a God of absolute perfect timing. I serve a God of mercy, forgiveness, love, goodness, kindness, compassion, and beauty. My God is all just, all powerful, everlasting, patient, extremely detail oriented, steadfast. <laughs> dependable, trustworthy, uncompromising, and faithful. If I don't believe in a good God, then I'm not going to be able to turn my will and my life over to the care of that higher power. When we have faith in someone's 
character, what they do becomes a whole lot less important because we know exactly who they are. I believe that character is not defined by actions, but rather that actions are determined by character. I don't need to worry or be afraid because my life is not a condition of my circumstances. It's a condition of my relationship with him. Let me say that again. I don't need to worry or be afraid because my life is not a condition of my circumstances. It's a condition of my relationship with him. That takes a whole lot of power out of the hands of the alcoholics in my life. <laughs> you see, your God and my God will never be any bigger than your concept of him. I have learned that my God will be faithful to me even when I fail to be faithful to him. I have learned that not only can he do for me what I cannot do for myself, but more often than not, he actually will. So let me ask you a question then. Do you have faith regardless of the circumstances of your life or the lives of those you love? That God is actually the God of the attributes you have listed? You see, we have to decide what we believe to be true regarding the nature of God, and then we need to hang on to that truth regardless of the circumstances we face. That's step three in action for me. That's what faith does. So if your child gets killed by a drunk driver, do you still serve a good God? If your spouse dies of alcoholism in front of your children, with no life insurance, do you still serve a God of provision and beauty? What's it going to be? Is it going to be the circumstances, or is it going to be your God? Are the circumstances going to be your God? Here's the thing. I learned that faith is not about God making his demonstration to me. I used to think that. People would say, you just need to have faith. And I thought, okay, what faith really equals is me getting what I want. But it turns out, faith is actually about me making my demonstration to him. Alcoholics make lousy higher powers. I think the biggest wrong I've ever committed in my life is turning my will and my life over the care of the alcoholics. The program and the professionals refer to this as codependency. Religious people would refer to it as idolatry. And the rest of the world would just call it crazy. <laughs> I have learned that God's will is not a treasure hunt or a corn maze for me to figure out. I believe his will for me slowly unfolds as I uh, continually meet my responsibility and do the next right thing. So for those of you, like me, who have ever suffered from confusion, felt overwhelmed, the reason I get those feelings is because I've gotten too far ahead of myself. If I'm just doing the next right thing, and the next right thing, and the next right thing, that's how God's will unfolds for me in my life. I learned in Al-Anon that I don't need to let other people hold my measuring stick. I am no longer defined by what the alcoholic says I am. And that's really important because for years in my life, people would look at me and they'd point their finger and they'd say, you know, you're controlling, you're manipulative, you're selfish. And here's the thing, I really believed them. And then I would try to be a better person because I didn't realize that every time they were pointing their finger at me, they had three other fingers pointing back at themselves and that they were really just projecting the bad feelings about themselves back onto me. I have learned that this is contemptuous behavior. I don't need to accept it from someone else and I certainly don't ever need to treat other people that way. I feel sad when I think about how much of my life was spent believing lies about myself that other people told me. You see, I allowed other people's opinions of me and the circumstances I was in. Anyone ever felt ashamed of your circumstances? I allowed those things to define me rather than allowing God to define me. I learned today that I get to define myself by who and what God says I am. 
This is going to require some prayer and research and meditation on your part. And again, I can't speak for you. I know that I am a beloved child of my Most High God. And here's the thing. I don't doubt that every single one of you are too. But as far as I'm concerned, I am his only child. <laughs> that's how sick I still am. <laughs> but that's the higher power I serve. He is my beloved father, and as far as, as we're concerned, I am his only child. I am his heir. I am a victor and not a victim. I went to a meeting once, which seemed a little flaky to me. You know some al can get that way from time to time. And um, the topic was gardening, and I didn't really like it. And uh, then I, you, you know, I kind of got into it. And the person was making an analogy for their life in a garden. And you know, I got to thinking about it, because not so much in Texas, but in other places in this country, you, you can garden, and things grow. <laughs> And I used to go to the nursery, and I would pick out bulbs and plants and seeds. And I'm not a master gardener by any stretch, but, you know, I like pretty things. And I'd, I'd put everything in my cart and go home and plant it. And I'd water it. And I'd wait to see what happens. But because I'm not a master gardener, like, I, I knew to get the bulbs in the right direction and stuff. But I didn't always know, you know, what was a good plant and what was a weed. And you know you don't want to pull expensive things that you've planted and invested yourself in. So you know I'd let them grow a little bit. Well, as many of you know, weeds have long roots. Weeds take up more than their fair share of resources, more than their fair share of sunlight and water, and space. And I've learned to do some work in my garden and pull some weeds. I have discernment today, which allows me to know which people I am willing to invest in and which people I am not willing to give my time, energy, and very best to. I'd like to speak for a moment about forgiveness. Usually when I go to an Al-Anon meeting and the topic is forgiveness, what we usually end up talking about is resentment. <laughs> And let's just be honest, it's probably true at the A's meetings too. For me, forgiveness means I don't, pay, I don't make someone pay the price they owe me for having caused a harm to me. It means that I can't hold on to my anger and resentment towards them because by doing so, I'm trying to exact a price. Forgiveness shows the account is paid in full, even though it's not. For me, forgiveness often doesn't just occur one time. Sometimes I have to make the choice a hundred times over not to exact a price for what I know somebody really does owe me. I used to think that forgiveness was a decision. Somebody would do, do me some wrong and I would make a choice to forgive them. And then what I would do is I would sweep that under the rug and put the rug back down and then, you know, choose not to discuss it again and just move on. That's not forgiveness, that's denial. Forgiveness doesn't excuse someone from the consequences of their actions. It just means I don't get to be the punisher. And I think, I think forgiveness can be hard for me because I feel like if I forgive someone, I'm letting them off the hook and it means that what they did to me doesn't matter, that they're not going to experience the consequences. And, and that's not forgiveness. It just means I'm not God. I don't get to be the punisher. I believe for me today, forgiveness confronts. Forgiveness calls someone out. Forgiveness requires vulnerability. If I have a problem with my husband, if I feel harmed by him, I have to say, you know, you did X, Y, and Z, and I felt like this. And, and I really have to put myself out there. And I, I have to label how I felt. I have to know how I felt. I have to be able to say what harm was caused. 
and, and I have to confront it. And you see, he can say, oh, I'm so sorry, that wasn't my intention, please forgive me, I never meant to hurt you. Or he could say, I never said that. That's not what happened, you misunderstood, right? Just because somebody doesn't own the harm doesn't mean that I don't have to forgive them. Why? Because it's not between me and my husband. It's not between me and David. It's not between me and you. Who's it between? Me and God. Yeah. So here's the other thing. Sometimes forgiveness walks away. I have learned that I can forgive someone and choose that I just no longer want to remain in that relationship. It's just not healthy for me. Forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. It's not the same thing. I know now that when I get rid of the weeds in my garden, it allows room for healthy things to grow that I do want. If I have to prune a tree or a bush back, really take it back, that often leaves me lonely, vulnerable, and at the receiving end of a lot of criticism. People don't like to be told, you know, this really isn't working for me and, and I need to step back. Rarely have I ever seen that go well in my life. <laughs> but here's the thing. It also makes me free because I take responsibility for my own life rather than blaming the condition of it on someone else. That leaves me a whole lot more powerful. God did not create me to be anyone's victim or hostage. I am free, and I am responsible. I once heard someone say, I don't honor you because you are honorable. I honor you because I am honorable. See, here's the thing. I don't treat you the way I treat you because of who you are. I treat you the way I treat you because of who I am. But that means that the opposite is also true. That means that if someone is treating me poorly, they're not treating me poorly because of who I am. They're treating me poorly because of who they are. I'm learning to make healthier choices regarding with whom I choose to associate with. I love Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was an essayist. I just love that. He once wrote, what you are, shout, shout so loudly I cannot hear what you say. Today, when I'm exercising discernment with regard to others, I don't listen to their words nearly as much as I watch their feet. I look at their fruit. <coughs> Excuse me. How do they behave? Water, please. Thank you. You warned me. <laughs> Thank you. I look at their fruit. How do they behave? Do they demonstrate integrity? Are they principled even when it's to their disadvantage? What is their marriage like? What are their children like? How is their profession going? I'm not saying that everything about a person's life has to be perfect or even good. But what I am saying is that apple trees bear apples and fig trees bear figs. I get to decide who I'm going to be and what I'm going to be about. And I get to decide who I'm going to surround myself with. I love you. I heard those words a lot from a lot of people in my life. Love is as love does. And I listened to the words far too long, and I couldn't figure out why I felt so bad. You know why I felt so badly? Because I wasn't being well loved. That's why I felt so badly. So uh, before I ever even came into Al-Anon, you should know, I was a professional detacher. I could sever you like a limb without losing a drop of blood. <laughs> I could walk away from anyone. And, like, I'm not exaggerating. I've done it. I may end up having to do it. Like, I know how to detach. And in El Anon, they talk about detachment with love. And I've learned how to do that too. And I believe that it can be incredibly helpful, especially for someone that's new in sobriety or when you're dealing with the crisis situation. 
But what I've also learned that personally for me, if I'm continually in a long-term relationship where I'm having to practice loving detachment all the time, that's not a sign of health for me. That's a sign of ill health. I want to be in healthier relationships where I don't have to work so hard. Don't get me wrong. Relationships require an immense amount of work for both parts of the relationship. But I don't want to have to work that hard anymore. I learned when I came in the program to keep the focus on myself. And, you know, and that, that's important, right? And, and sometimes if you know someone in my life was behaving badly, I'd say, well, you know, that's unacceptable, but I can't change that person, so I'm just going to keep the focus on myself. And you know what that did? That enabled a lot of bad behavior. It failed to bind bad behavior. And it was good, and it was helpful, all the way up to the point where I began not even needing certain people in my life, like, like David. You see, the principle was good, but the way I was applying it was bad. A marriage doesn't need a self-centered alcoholic along with a self-centered Al-Anon. A marriage and a family need two people that are willing to sacrifice for the betterment of one another and the family unit. I'd like to speak for a moment on sponsorship. That probably goes worse than the forgiveness meetings. Um, usually, and I don't know what it's like in California, but the meetings I've been to, uh, you know, the way that topic usually goes is, well, I don't have a sponsor. I'm not sure how to get a sponsor, so let's just talk for a moment. I think, personally, the best way to get a sponsor is to go up to someone to whom you can relate and say, may I have your number so I might call you? And then you try calling that person. And if that works out really well for about six months, then you ask them to be your sponsor because it's very uncomfortable when you ask and then you realize it's not a good match because then you either just have to outright fire them, which I've done and that did not go well because, like I said earlier, people don't like that. Or, you know, then it's just awkward. So, you know, usually people will say, I don't have a sponsor. And then, of course, the other thing they'll say is, I have a sponsor, I just don't ever call her. And... If you're a female, you need a female sponsor. And if you're a male, you need a male sponsor because there's a reason people choose sponsors of the opposite sex. And it's because they can get away with things that they wouldn't be able to get away with had they had a sponsor of the same sex. That's kind of putting it out there a little bit more flatly, but you know it's true. Um, that brings us to the fourth step. And I, I had a lot of trouble on the third step, but it seems to me like a lot of people get through the first three steps okay, but they, they end up stalling on the fourth step. And from what I see, most people just never get past it. They just don't do it or they don't finish it. Um, making a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself is important because when I do that process, when I do that first step, what it means is I'm accepting personal responsibility. You see, up until then, we could blame everything on the alcoholic, right? Because let's be honest, their, like, their defects are glaring compared to ours, right? I mean, it, I, it's true. You know it's true, right? By doing the fourth step, I accept personal responsibility for my life. That personal responsibility equals freedom. If I'm always blaming the condition of my life on what the alcoholics did to me, I'm being held hostage. There's no freedom in that. And I'm a, I'm a, willing, I'm a willing hostage at that. You see, the reason I believed the lies that the alcoholics in my life told me was because I hadn't properly done my fourth and fifth steps. Now, if someone wants to point the finger at me, let me have it. Because you know what, I know who and what I am and who and what I'm about. And you can point the finger, and I might agree, and I might disagree, but I'm not going to be defined by it. I've learned that to be eager in my heart to be angry or resentful is nothing more than living a victim mentality. 
I guess I somehow thought that if I held on to the hurt tight enough, it would keep me from having to repeat the scenarios. Right? We in Ellen on love to do that. We, we take those harms and hurts and we just clutch them and hold them tight to our chest. But all I ever really did was harm me and the people I was angry and resentful with. At the end of the day, it's not between me and anybody else. It's between me and God. I don't answer to you, and I don't answer to the alcoholics in my life. I answer to God. When I cut out the middleman, my part became a lot clearer. Things didn't get as messy. I have better boundaries, and there's a lot less triangulation. I'd like to speak for a moment about boundaries. I don't set boundaries for you. I set boundaries for me. What does that look like? So I would not say to my husband, you know what, it's not OK with me for you to drink. Wait, I don't get to set that boundary. The boundary I get to set is, I'm not willing to be married to somebody who drinks. You know why it's hard to set boundaries? Because if we're going to follow through on them, it's going to cost us something. You got, you got to, well, I can't even say it, but you just better pull up your panties and get ready for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so with priorities, I've learned that saying yes to one thing means saying no to another. There was a woman named Mary when I first came into the program, and she'd say almost every meeting, what I value tells you who I am. Listen to this carefully. People don't ever need to tell you what they value. You know why? Because ultimately, they live what they value. How I spend my time, how I spend my energy, how I spend my money will tell you what I value and what my priorities are. By a living according to my priorities, I'm able to set better boundaries. So David mentioned earlier, uh, I think today, that a while back we went through a difficult time. We've been married for, for 31 years. We've been together for 35 years. And I've only ever known him in sobriety. We have known better, and we have known worse. And for reasons I just can't articulate, um, I don't know, maybe five years ago, seven years ago, it didn't happen all at once. Things just started to get really bad. And, you know, he said, you know, that I, I acted worse in sobriety. I forget exactly what you said, but, you, you know, it, it, I would talk to my people about it, and they would say, Brendan, are you sure he's not drinking? He kind of sounds like he's active. <laughs> and I'd say, I'm telling you, I am with him 24-7. There's no way he's drinking. But I know this is crazy. And things had gotten very scary. I was very scared. And I felt like I was wearing a handmade sweater that had a little pull in it. And someone just came along and walked by and pulled the sweater. And it felt like my whole life was unraveling. And here's the thing. I had done my best. And I wasn't able to affect a change on the situation. And there were, in my opinion, some destructive things happening. And I had to make some decisions. And so I did. And. Um, a wise person said, you know, do the footwork and then wait for the nudge of God. And I did that. Because, you see, there are moments in our lives which are defining moments. And we don't know it at the time. But you know how all of a sudden you say or you do something and then you look back and you're like, I can't believe I did that. And I've done that in my marriage. There have been times when it's like, you know, that's it. But I hadn't quite felt the nudge of God. And the saddest part, I think the hardest thing I, I, I felt was that I had missed out on God's destiny for me. I felt like, you know, maybe I, I planted 
carrots when I wanted peas. Like maybe, maybe there were red flags and, and I just missed them and now I'm here because of, of poor choices I made and I missed out on God's best for me. I missed out on God's destiny for me. That was a very difficult time and I'm very grateful to say I don't think I've ever been more happily married to my husband today. And I'd like to tell you that that was because I just worked a program of Al-Anon so well. <laughs> but that's not true because, I, you know, I was doing my best then and I'm continuing to do my best. I can't explain what happened that made things worse and I can't explain what happened that made things better. But I can tell you this, no one, no one, and nothing can cause me to miss out on God's destiny for me. I don't serve a God in a box. I serve a big God who is more powerful than any alcoholic and than any circumstance. And part of what I did during that period of time, you know why it looms so large? Because I made him my higher power again. I'd like to speak for a moment about gratitude. When I came in the program, they told me to make a gratitude list, and I did. I'm grateful for David and for our health and for our sobriety and for our children and for the job and the insurance, and it was a good list. A lot of things on it. It was a bit dry. And then I was challenged to make a list of a thousand things I was grateful for. And if you're going to make a list of a thousand things you're grateful for, you're going to have to be a lot more detail-oriented. So what that might look like, you know, uh, today is, you know, I'm grateful for, I don't even know what you call a flock of dragonflies, but uh, we, have, we have flocks of dragonflies that fly around. You know, I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm grateful when I see the dog get out of the water and, and the... the the water is, you know, flying off of her with the sunlight behind it. Things like that go on my list today. You see, every day I am faced with the same choice, contentment or dissatisfaction. One practices gratitude and promises happiness, and the other practices complaint and promises destruction. I would encourage you to make a list I wouldn't encourage you to just make a gratitude list. I would encourage you to make a list of a thousand things. And you know what you start with? Number one. I'd like to say I work on that list every day. I do work on it most days, but sometimes I'll pick up my gratitude journal and I can see, oh my gosh, it's been a week. I did that several years ago, a while ago more than several years ago, and I'm up over 6,000 now. And you know when it's most important for me to get out my gratitude journal is when I'm feeling least grateful. And I start writing down, and of course the more I start writing, the more I realize I have to be grateful. I believe that one of the most powerful prayers I can say to my higher power is thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. There are promises in AA and I believe that God makes promises to me as well. I believe that these promises are most often conditional, even in the big book of AA, which is not approved Al-Anon literature, by the way. <laughs> they, uh, they'll probably, you know, uh, materialize if we work for them, right? You see, most people want to claim the promise without doing the work. To receive the promise is going to cost me something. I am always going to pay a price, whether I, I'm an Al-Anon member or I'm not an Al-Anon member. I'm married, I'm not married. I go to school, I don't go to school. I get a job, I don't get a job. It doesn't matter. I'm o always going to pay a price. The question is, what price am I going to pay? I think an even better question is, what price is too high? Because when you know what price is too high, you just found your boundary. Here's the thing. <coughs> Suffering is never wasted. We've suffered, right? It only feels like it's wasted, but it's never wasted. I believe that God uses it to refine me so I might be of service to others. 
I believe that God has used it so that I can be up here tonight. And by doing so, my hope is to bring glory to him. I have learned that it's okay for me to accept the goodness in my life without continually feeling afraid that the other shoe's going to drop. We talk a lot about that in Al-Anon, the feeling of like, it's almost like we need to worry because if we worry, it's a form of control that will keep something bad from happening. It, it, it's step two, right? It's crazy. Absolutely nothing in this world is beyond the control of my higher power. It only takes one breath from him. I could stand up here and cite situation after situation after situation in my life and the lives of those I love as examples. I promise you, I have seen huge situations that seemed insurmountable change in the course of a day, in the course of a counseling session, in the course of opening a letter. You see, God works in spite of things. God works in spite of our circumstances, in spite of what we believe to be possible, in spite of what other people say, in spite of the odds, outside of the perimeters in which we reside. I may be powerless over alcohol and over the alcoholic, but I get to decide exactly who and what my higher power is going to be for me, as do you. And I also get to decide exactly who and what I'm going to be about. I have an incredible amount of power, and the program has taught me to use it wisely. Thank you for letting me share with you tonight. Thank you.